Hello, everybody. Welcome to the afternoon session here at the keynote stage. Um, my name is Sho Kuomoto. Uh, I've been at Figma since we were like 10 people in this small room, and we were in stealth mode. And uh, we weren't allowed to tell anybody what we were doing. And uh, if you were to tell me, the me of back then uh, what things were going to be like now with all of you guys here uh, coming to hang out with us, I would have just been blown away. This is crazy to me that, that, that we're here. And Carmel, uh, who's going to be leading our panel today, uh, she's been with us for just about as long. Uh, Carmel really focuses on telling the story of Figma, uh, both internally and externally. She does a super, super good job of just really getting to know people, asking them the right questions. Uh, and we're going to learn today about uh, the next generation of designers, something very near and dear to my heart. So, Carmel. Thanks, Joe. Let's see. Is By it way, on? Please Are we good? Carmel. Oh, I, I require applause. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, it's great to be here. I think. We are really excited at how many people came to this panel. Um, I'm particularly excited about this talk because I've been following the story of design education and what's happening with the next generation of designers pretty much since I joined Figma. Um, one of the people on our panels, B.E., actually kickstarted my interest in the subject. He ran a small uh, nonprofit in Lagos, uh, Nigeria in 2017 in March when most people in Silicon Valley had never even heard of Figma. Uh, he was teaching it to young kids uh, abroad. And so he tweeted at us photos of them in the classroom, and we were like, what's happening here? Um, and that kind of kick-started uh, what's basically been three years of realizing the ways that design is becoming the next economic opportunity, the next career path, in the same ways that we saw coding do, um, you know, kind of starting around the time that the iPhone came out. And so it makes a lot of sense, right? Like, Coding came out, a lot of people didn't know how to code. Uh, smartphones got popular, tech companies are like, shit. Oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this thing. Skim. We're all adults. Whoops. Yeah. <laughs> um, companies are like, we need to hire more coders, we need engineers, but they weren't teaching it in schools. And so it took a while for everyone to kind of race to catch up and for schools to start offering it for kids to learn. But the kids wanted to learn because they looked around them and they said, you know, this is like uh, the way that our world works today. I use my phone and my apps all the time. Like, I know that this makes a lot of sense and I want to be able to build. And they kind of had to look for opportunities. 10 years later, 2020, it's less, uh, there's a lot more programs out there. Um, there's a lot more resources for people that want to learn. It's no longer kind of like a, oh, you're a coder. It's like a super unique skill. Sorry for any coders in the audience. There's more of you that have come up in the generation since uh, 2010. Uh, but what we've seen is that design is sort of the next chapter of that. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Like, it's gotten easier to start companies. Amazon Web Services has made things cheap. People can kind of spin up apps um, and launch them on Product Hunt in the span of a couple days if they wanted. Um, and so what differentiates companies, products, experiences is the design. It's the user experience of it. And so companies are hiring a lot more designers. The schools are attempting to catch up, and uh, kids and students are realizing that like, this is a job opportunity that they want to do so that they can kind of build the things that they're interested in. And uh, that's what this panel is all about, and we brought people from a range of different backgrounds to come talk about their experiences teaching the next generation. So you'll hear from people um, that are doing everything from small nonprofits abroad to teaching young kids to uh, universities that are introducing like design, uh, more design education and expanding their programs. Um, and so it's a lot of different perspectives. They're each gonna give a little lightning talk that sort of uh, talks a bit about their program and tells you some stories of what they've seen. Um, and then we're gonna have time for an audience Q&A afterwards. And so we'll see how this works because last time I checked a max Figma file, number of people who can be in it is 50. Uh, so if it gets overrun, uh, be patient with us. But, uh, oh no, it went to screensaver. Show warned me about this. Yeah. Give me a sec. So there's a Figma file that lists um, kind of the different speakers that, on, that are on stage. And as they give their lightning talks, if you have follow-up questions that you want to ask them, go ahead and throw them into... Uh-oh. Do we have a clicker malfunction? Let me try... Mm -hmm. There we go. I may have to stand here to do it. Hopefully not, we'll find out. 
Um, so yeah, if you have questions, um, feel free to put them in the Figma file. The link is bit.ly slash config bubble. Um, it, if it gets overrun, I apologize in advance. Um, we kind of came up with this idea at the last minute. And uh, one of my colleagues at Figma is gonna be picking a few of the most compelling or interesting questions, and we'll have like 20 minutes at the end to go through those audience Q and A's. Um, so yeah, that's the overview. Uh, I'm really excited to introduce our first speaker. Um, this is someone that uh, I was desperately hoping would come because I think that the thing that's like most interesting about what's happening in design education is the fact that it's following the computer science trajectory. And many of you may know this, some of you may not, but code.org is an organization that has made that accessible and open uh, to students across the country. And so um, uh, Alana is uh, you know, our developer code representative on this panel who's going to like, help us trace the journey that code took in the last 10 years, 10 to 20 years. Um, and so we kind of understand that framework before we design, dive into the design talks. Um, so. Alana, I'll let you take it away, and I'll just stand up here so when we get to the video part. Yeah, we could do that first. Yeah. So uh, we're just going to play a, a quick one-minute video that um, kind of captures the Code.org initiative, just for those of you who aren't that familiar with it, and then Alana will talk more about her experience. Oh. It's possible the video won't work. Let's see. Okay, that's a bummer. It looks like the video is maybe a no-go. It doesn't like the projector mode. Oh, I spoke too soon. Students around the world had an hour of code today. It's part of a global movement to show kids what it takes to create the programs and apps they spend so much time using. The largest education events in history. Organizers set what they called an ambitious goal of reaching 10 million students this week. Almost 15 million signed up. This week I'm proud to join the students, teachers, businesses, and nonprofit organizations taking new steps to support computer science in America's schools. <laughs> You get the idea. Um, so Alana is here today to tell you a little bit more about her story in code.org. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you. Oh, yeah. A little applause. <laughs> so I actually started out as a classroom teacher, as you saw. Um, I did not study computer science. I have no background in CS or design. So excuse my ignorance. Um, but I discovered the Hour of Code in 2013 when Code.org first launched. Um, so we've really only been around a little over six years. Uh, and I was at a teacher professional development and they said this would be a cool activity to do with kids with special needs in your inclusion class. And I thought to myself, like, this seems like something all my kids should do. Uh, so we tried an Hour of Code. It was a hit. Um, and so I found Code.org's first 20-hour course online and implemented that in my fifth grade classroom in Washington Heights in New York City. Um, and I was on like lesson three when I got a call from Code.org saying, CBS This Morning wants to do a piece on our organization. Can we come film in your classroom? So this is Hadi Partovi, our founder in my classroom. I think I was on lesson three. Uh, and I had to pretend like I, know what I, I knew what I was talking about, teaching a lesson about algorithms, um, which teaching is acting, essentially. So uh, I had to pretend like I knew what I was talking about, because um, really I was just figuring out the curriculum day by day with my students. A lot of them were going far and away faster than I could even figure it out. Um, and so, do you want to go to the next slide? Oh, yeah, sorry, I just got so wrapped up and you're talking, I forgot. 
Um, so this is one of my fifth grade students, Julaney, and what was amazing about Julaney is she took her love of programming and used it to include students um, in the classroom that didn't otherwise connect very well with a lot of the other students. So she lived at, with her mother and grandmother and five siblings and would move back and forth between Dominican Republic and New York City um, where her family was. Um, but she got really into computer science and she would take her little notebooks home every night and handwrite the block programming and come to school the next day and like beg to, to put it into action. Um, so she ended up like designing this whole video for our school kickoff and she included kids with autism in the programming portion and she brought in um, some of our students who were recent arrivals from other countries and didn't speak English um, in the video production part and she just like made it a very creative, collaborative um, experience for everyone in the class. Uh, and that was just, that essentially captures like what was so amazing about teaching computer science is my entire class was engaged and it gave them an opportunity to do something creative and collaborative that felt really relevant to them. Um, so, really quickly, uh, I now work full time at Code. So I went on to, te to work at the New York City Department of Education on the 10-year CS for All initiative to get CS to 1.1 million students by 2025. Worked on that for a couple of years and launched an elementary school computer science program for the city. Um, now I live back out here, out west in Portland. Um, not here, but this <laughs> side of the country. Um, and I work for Code.org based in Seattle, uh, and I lead our outreach team. And we work with 60 regional partners nationally to train teachers on our curriculum so that they can then uh, teach kids. Um, and so we've scaled tremendously in six years. Uh, we even have an international program now. Um, and so it's been really interesting to meet my fellow panelists because I see, I'm hearing about similar things happening in design that happened with computer science. Cool. I think part of the reason I was like uniquely interested in this story about the rise of design is because back in 2013, I was an education technology reporter. So I was covering code.org, um, which is how we got Alana to come out here, even though she's not a designer. <laughs> um, okay, so next up, we've got Maurice Woods, which you know some of you, if you do volunteering in the Bay Area, may be familiar with his work. He's been running a pretty amazing program for 20 years. Uh, that teaches kids uh, in the Bay Area how to do design. And I'll let him take it away. Thank you. So, um... <laughs> we won't make you clap for everyone. That was like just for me as I. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, a quick history about myself. I um, am a practicing designer. Um, I started off not that way. My goal was to be a NBA star. <laughs> um, for those of you who are, are wondering how tall I am, um, I'm 6'10". Um, so I'm not an NBA player, just in case you guys were thinking maybe that's, <laughs> what's this NBA player doing on the stage? Um, so my background is in design and, you know, um, throughout the course of my years uh, growing up, uh, design was never something that I thought that I would do. Uh, it was something that um, I was exposed to uh, via a basketball scholarship to a college. And so um, the work that we do at Interact Project is based on this notion that there's other kids out there that are talented and that have um, creative interest. And we wanted to be able to foster that interest, specifically kids in the community, and provide them with opportunities to be exposed to design and then also learn more about design, and then eventually get a career in design or go to design school. And so um, a lot of the work that we do with students kind of varies across a variety of different things. Yes, we have education and we teach kids, you know, skills, practical, you know, hard skills, soft skills, and all of that is important. 
but we generally try to tailor that with other opportunities for them to learn about design, which um, manifests itself in um, advocacy and learning and seeing people of color in the business, also learning about the impact of design in their lives and how design is something that um, they can use to empower themselves. So um, this is kind of just showing, you know, a, an example of, you know, our students, you know, a lot of our students, again, are middle school and high school. We start from a very young age and we just get them to think. This is not necessarily about them early on learning how to use necessary tools, but just getting them first get the foundation of what does it mean to think about how to solve something that I care about and use the skills that I have to actually, you know, build something that can actually impact someone. Um, yeah. Uh, this specific example is um, an example where we had a student, her name is Sierra, and it's a very interesting case because, um, you know, we have this class where we wanted students to be able to uh, comprehend the power of what design can be. And for her, you know, uh, it was important for us to provide an opportunity for her to bring in context of her own life so that she can see the importance of design and how that um, is interpreted as something that she can actually understand. And it was interesting because she took this case of her grandmother who has a walker and a cane, and uh, she saw the complexities of the walker and the cane, you know, uh, it was very interesting, the observations that she had, like, you know, the wheels are made of hard plastic, so it was very hard to roll on the cement. Um, it wasn't comfortable for her in all places because they had to carry it up the stairs, and when they go different places, uh, she had to, you know, basically um, take this device and figure out how to fold it up and use a cane. So there was a lot of complications that she saw and she took it upon herself to actually design this walker cane, uh, um, uh, you know, mechanism or product where it would actually use rubber wheels so it was easy to roll on the ground. The handles were er uh, ergonomic for her grandmother and then also it would fold up in, from a walker into an actual cane. So these are things that we really sort of strive to work with our kids on is not just uh, designing um, to you know, um, work on a project specifically, but how can they use their skills in design to actually impact their communities and their world. Cool. We can just clap at the end. We don't have to <laughs> make your hands heard. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Maurice. So uh, the next person is Elizabeth Lynn. Um, she is a longtime Bay Area resident who actually went to my alma mater, Cal, Go Bears. Um, you're required to say it. Uh, if you go there, it's a contract. Um, Elizabeth has uh, touched design education in a lot of different places, from um, the university setting where she taught classes and helped TA to uh, Lambda School Now, which some of you may be familiar with, where she's figuring out how to make design accessible to people that may be wanting to do a career change or hadn't studied it in school. So take it away. Oh. oh, no. Okay. Hi, everyone. So, um, originally, when I uh, entered college, um, design wasn't really a thing yet. I was mostly just kind of playing around with things online. Um, I grew up loving Neopets. I don't know how many of you played around with Neopets, but yeah, <laughs> Neopets is really awesome. It made those like uh, glitter GIF things, but um, I was just playing with around with like things on the internet and I wanted to study computer science because my parents were like, that's a smart thing to do. And I was like, okay. And so I was just mostly doing like design stuff for fun, didn't know that it was gonna be a serious thing. Um, and so I joined some clubs on campus where people were just making flyers for fun. Um, and it was really, really awesome for like a year. Um, and during my sophomore year, I randomly got this opportunity to teach um, this class called Introduction to Illustrator and Photoshop. So one of the seniors basically nominated me to teach it. Um, and I was like, okay, sure. And so I kind of panicked and 
I took one of my breaks and I like read this thing called the Illustrator Bible, which I got at the library um, during my, I think it was like winter or summer break or something. And I like read every single page of it and took like a million notes and prepared like these like lesson plans for like a weekly basis. Um, and so the first semester I taught it, um, it was pretty chill. There was like 30 people in our class and we got like around 100 applicants. And so 100 sounds like a lot, but um, the following semester I taught it again. And um, this is a picture uh, just like the start of like this info session that we had, and we had over 300 applicants for an introduction to Illustrator and Photoshop class. Um, our team would often joke that it was harder to get into this decal than a decal is basically like a student talk class than it was was to get into Harvard. Um, if you go to the next slide, I actually dug this up. This was like the Google. Um, the Google form that we had where people would sign up when they entered our info session so that we would know they were there. And just like endless, it was just like so many people on the list. So it was really wild. I was really, really caught off guard by how many people were interested in just learning design tools. I think uh, part of the reason why was because people just wanted to learn how to make stuff. It just, design is really fun. You can make like these fun posters and enabling someone to know how to use a tool like Illustrator um, was a really great way to do that. And so, um, something else that stood out to me during my time in college was um, d during my first two years, I think I was primarily focused on just like doing stuff like this, just like making some posters for fun. I wasn't really thinking about like product design or UX design. Um, a lot of that stuff was just still for me, something that was just fun. Um, these are just some um, images from uh, the class that I taught. Looking back at them, they're really ugly, but I thought this was really <laughs> clever. So you could like make a cookie like outline in Illustrator, and I thought that was pretty fun. Um, anyway, so um, looking back at my time in college, um, there was a very distinct moment my junior year when I was like helping out with this freshman program, and um, one of the freshman students who was incoming, she came up to me and she's like, Elizabeth, like I want to join your club right now because I want to become a product designer. And I was like, what? Like, how do you even know what a product designer is? Um, I, don't, I barely know what it is. And I thought that was really interesting because um, for the first couple years I was there, I felt like I was like the only person that was really like kind of doing like some design stuff with like web. And so um, there's just been a really big influx, at least during my time at Cal. Um, and finally, during the last period of my time at Cal, um, we started talking more about having an actual like design minor. And so um, I got really involved with a group of students from an interdisciplinary, like from, um, so I was in computer science, there's like a student from architecture, and so students from all over the place. Um, we were kind of pulled together by one of the people um, that was like in like the design department. And she wanted us to kind of put together a proposal for what the future of the design program might look like. And so um, unfortunately, that didn't get realized until after I graduated. But if you go to the next slide, um, there's this fancy new building now at Cal called Jacobs Design Institute that um, I would hope is kind of there because of the work all the students were doing on the ground up. And so um, it's really awesome to see how important design is now, um, especially at a big university like Cal. And just really interesting to see how many people really want to get involved. Um, after college, um, I was still really passionate about education, and so um, I decided to join Khan Academy. And so while I was at Khan Academy, if you go on to the next slide, I did some stuff. I yeah, no worries. Green is next. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so while I was at Khan Academy, um, I was doing a lot of stuff around like um, designing tools for classrooms and for students. And so um, this is probably the favorite thing I made while I was there. But um, it was really, really fun to kind of see the other side of things, so making tools for other people um, and really getting to understand like um, pedagogical principles and what teachers um, want to use in their classroom. Um, and I've been recently taking that to, um, oops, back. Oh, interesting. It, it, well, okay. Well, anyway, so I've taken that to um, Lambda School. And so um, at Lambda School, I run the experiential learning portion of um, the design program. And so that's basically where students um, put what they learn into practice. And so um, if you look at that slide, um, I guess it doesn't want to show my overlay, so Google Slides. But anyway, this is like one of our classroom activities where um, we really encourage students to kind of all work together um, in class and iterate together. And all our lessons are done in a collaborative way. Um, it's been really fun to work on this, and I'm really excited to see what we do in the future. Yeah. Cool. Um, also, a shout out. I have two students in the audience right now, Lauren and Marlene. Um, so I'll say hi to them later. Um, they're right there. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Yeah. Um, so uh, the Cal, Elizabeth's experience at Cal was like particularly interesting for me, obviously, because I went there. But my, my sister was an art major at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, 
I remember she wanted to learn graphic design and tech design because it had started to take off and there were no options. And when I first uh, joined Figma, I went to a Berkeley classroom and it was like the one design class on campus. It was 2017 and we did like a case study on what they were doing, which Elizabeth later TA'd that class. So it was super interesting to um, basically a year and a half or two years later have them open an entire institute and hall devoted to interdisciplinary design and tech design um, and just kind of like see that shift in real time. Um, but I would say I think like Berkeley um, and like a few other schools like the one that Miguel is about to tell us about are kind of ahead of the pack on that and most universities are probably the way they were when you guys were students where like there just aren't many options because the schools haven't figured out that this matters. Um, so yeah, Miguel uh, is our next speaker. He is coming from the Rochester Institute of Technology where he has both been like a student and a professor for eons. And uh, <laughs> he's up close and personal with kind of like this next generation of designers, <laughs> some of whom are in the audience, so we'll be awkwardly talking about you. Um, and I will let him take it away. Do you wanna do the well, clicker? Yeah, sure. Green is forward, red is Green backwards. Is forward. Cool. If it freaks out, just hand it back to me. All right. So um, as, as you mentioned, I've, I've been at the Rochester Institute of Technology for eons. Um, <laughs> I was actually part of the second graduating class of our program. So currently, I'm an assistant professor of uh, new media design, and I also teach graduate visual communications design. Um, so here talking mostly about the new media design program. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary program that um, I was actually just having a, a discussion with uh, an alumni who was in the audience, uh, Josh Mateo, uh, over at Netflix. Um, so he was class of uh, 11, uh, 2011, and um, he was basically saying that, yeah, it was just this really weird program where, like, you know, one day you're illustrating, one day you're photographing, animating, doing 3D, next day you're coading. And it's this, like, interdisciplinary major that kind of came out of the, the dot-com boom. Um, unfortunately, I started around the dot-com bust. So I started in uh, fall of 2000. So they were like, oh, yeah, maybe there might be a job. Um, so this is the first thing that I ever did. Uh, I often talk about how, um, you know, like, like the nature of the, the web was, was so great, or the beginning of the web was so great because you could just learn so much through view source, right? This is even like pre-CSS. Um, I was uh, like, you know, I don't know, like uh, really didn't know where I was going to be doing with my life when I was like 15, 16, and uh, I, I, I used a computer once. This was like 1996. And I was like, I'm going to buy a computer. So like, you know, I worked off of a fruit truck um, delivering produce to restaurants. And uh, I saved up. I bought my first computer. Uh, within a month, I had my first website within that, by that summer. Um, I got a mayor summer youth internship where I basically designed and developed an entire website. Um, I don't know why they gave that responsibility to a 16-year-old. Um, <laughs> but they were just like, you could do web stuff. And instead of having to go into the park and clean out the trash cans, I got to uh, uh, make this website, which um, I still, back in the day, I, I put it up on tripod.com. It's kind of like GeoCities. Anybody remember Tripod? Still kind of exists. It's still there, yeah. Um, so this was still archived on tripod.com. And my code was still in there. I wrote in Miguel Cardona customized HTML. So um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to share that with you all. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about just the, the, the things that I've been seeing over the years. So I actually started teaching at RIT in, uh, actually it was 2005, I keep saying 2006, but when I looked back it was 2005. I graduated in 2004, um, I worked at a gaming studio, I worked at an interactive ad agency, uh, then I started a, a company uh, in Rochester with a professor of mine um, and, a, and another colleague. And uh, I immediately had the opportunity to dig in and, and start adjuncting. Um, so this is the New Media Lab. Um, it's kind of like this wonderful place where a lot of collaboration happens, um, a lot of coding, a lot of development. Um, and so I, I'm here to talk about kind of like three characteristics of the kind of like incoming student, right? And like I said, I've been seeing students, and I was a student in 2000, and seeing them come all the way through. Um, so, uh, you know, here's, oh, they're, they're a little bit out of order, but uh, that's okay. I can. That's my bad. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, they're inherently collaborative, right? Um, so, uh, basically what I want to say with this is I know that a lot of companies, and um, I didn't mention this, but I have also worked in the industry uh, as I was teaching, like, a little bit further. Um, I've worked here in San Francisco. Uh, I was a lead designer at a startup called Imagix. Uh, by the way, the CEO and the CTO were both RIT New Media. Um, so it was Y Combinator backed. 
Um, and the one thing that I recognize like working here is that there's, there's still like a lot of siloing that's happening in the industry. You know, like the, the designers hand things off to, to devs um, and, and it, there's this interesting thing where you're just constantly trying to figure out how to like match up that communication. So um, this program doesn't believe in silos. In the first year, you know, the coders are taking the design classes and the design classes are taking coding classes. Um, and the uh, uh, thing, that, thing about that screen, I had uh, Arduino setups next to their callig calligraphy work. Um, students are having and making their own and building their own networks. Uh, current student right now, Haskew, um, developed this site, put it up on co uh, uh, Product Hunt, it's called Cofolios, uh, where you can go and see the portfolios of students that have worked at um, Google, uh, Apple, uh, there were Kleiner Perkins fellows, uh, and then that has since branched off into a bunch of other products called Office Hours and Case Studies, where new students can also begin to interact and be part of those networks. Uh, there's that slide again. Um, also, students are much more attuned and understanding like what is happening in the industry, right? They're much more concerned with uh, concepts such as like design ethics, accessibility, sustainability, um, and they're kind of hardwired for this, right? So the first thing I was talking about was you know this cross collaboration. It's inherent, right? They're using compu uh, cloud computing, right? They're 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 collaborating in team projects. They're they're working together cross discipline. Uh, in our school, we have industrial designers work with computer engineers, working with interior design. Um, this is Nasha. Uh, she was working on a project in my class, and uh, I told her to spin it. Like, just think about what this is like for like the near blind user. Um, we think a lot about accessibility at RIT. We also host the National Technical Institute for the Deaf. So, in any one of my classes, I'm going to have deaf students in my class. So, accessibility is at the forefront of you know, the learning experience. Uh, this project uh, is just something that she was working on. Um, Google stopped by, uh, we had representatives from Google Creative Lab, and they offered her an internship, just like looking at her thought process, looking at her work, and saying, wow, you're actually right on board with a lot of the things that we're looking to solve right now. Um, and it's been pretty commonplace. Um, so, you know, students nowadays, I, I would say that the key trait is, is that uh, if you think about it, design is problem solving, design is storytelling, but at the core, it's curiosity, right? So they have this curiosity, um, and the best design students that you're gonna see is gonna have this innate curiosity. And as designers, developers in the field, you know, holding on to that curiosity and, and moving forward um, is really what's gonna like, make the biggest difference. Um, so they're coming out with a lot of the things that you're just learning at the same time uh, as their baseline. So it's gonna be really interesting to see you know, what they're gonna be doing uh, on, uh, with the next generation that comes Nico, out. Nico, I have to cut you off, yeah. I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> we knew it was gonna be tough. Everyone has like super interesting <laughs> stories and like really different experiences. And so, but we wanted to make sure that you guys got the chance to ask all the questions. So I warned Miguel in advance and hopefully you don't hate me. Uh, <laughs> there's some good questions coming in. I just wanna like remind you of the URL. Um, it's bit.ly backslash, hold on, I'm pulling it up backslash config bubble, C-O-N-F-I-G bubble. So yeah, I've got uh, some of the questions coming in. Some of you are disagreeing with my premise, which I'm really excited about. As like a former journalist, I love a little bit of like narrative tension. So uh, <laughs> ask your questions as you go along. All right, uh, our final uh, speaker is uh, B, who um, is the person that uh, is the story that I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the talk, where B kind of kicked off um, us paying attention to what was happening in design education and design as like an economic opportunity. Um, and I'll never forget getting on the phone with him and hearing his story and I just thought it was like super fascinating and inspirational and um, pretty different from um, the stuff that like the way that I had learned growing up. So take it away, B. Okay, um, hello everyone. I'm from Lagos, Nigeria um, and I've stayed there for over 30 years of my life. Um, as a kid, I grew up in the slums of Lagos. Um, my dad owned a little printer press, and he had one computer there. And it was through that computer I started doing graphics design. I had um, one of those cracked versions of Photoshop and Corel Draw to play around. Um, <laughs> I did flyers and posters and all those kind of stuff for him. Um, um, but that, that kind of gave me like some guide to what I wanted to do in life because I saw myself as a creative person. Um, after that, I went to the university, um, University of Lagos. And by the way, university is really cheap in Nigeria. It's like, uh, 
with like $1,000, you would get a BSc. And um, yeah, so we don't get bothered by student loans, yeah. um, which is a very oh. cool thing. Um, so because of that, uh, I, I, have, I studied computer science. I know how to write codes. I know how to build applications. But I saw myself as a designer. I was very artistic as a kid. Um, I graduated in 2008. Um, we also felt a bit of the recession in my country. And getting out into the industry at that time, I couldn't find jobs. I couldn't find jobs because I wasn't the conventional developer everyone was expecting. I was a designer, and the industry didn't understand what design was. Like, you don't write code, or do you write code? And you do, I mean, they didn't think that it was necessary to you know, be artistic about the kind of applications we were building then. Most of them were government applications or banks. They were not like end user type applications. And so because of that, I struggled at first with my career, couldn't find jobs, I wasn't making money. Um, I had to preach design to companies so that they could hire me. Sometimes I had to cut my price very low. Um, I couldn't even afford uh, a house to stay. I remember a friend took me in with like 14 other guys. We stayed in the same room. I used to use my backpack as my pillow, so I keep my laptop in it so that someone would take it off before I wake up. But it, it, with all that, that I, it started coming to an end when the recession started fading away and um, the country started coming back in shape. Economy was doing well. Then mobile phone prices started crashing, and um, Nigeria has a very large population. I'm talking about 200 million people. So imagine 200 million potential users of your solution. Um, Internet became very cheap. Um, but now was a good opportunity for me because I'm one of the first designers everybody in the industry knows. Um, so the gigs just keep coming in like, dude, can you design this? Can you design that? Mm -hmm. um, from gigs to gigs to um, getting jobs in um, in companies where I was the first US designer for a company of 10,000 staffs. And so th that was really, really, um, uh, it made me really glad coming from my humble beginnings to the point where I was um, rejecting jobs because I was swamped with jobs. Um, but that even came to a climax when someday I was working on my laptop and I saw a message from a recruiter from the Netherlands, and the dude has some weird Dutch name I can't even pronounce. Um, and I, 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 he said, oh, we, we love your profile. We do like to work for Booking.com in Amsterdam. At that time, I've not heard of Booking.com before. We have our um, hotel NG in Nigeria, which is like an alternative to Booking. We have our own e-commerce companies and the likes that we don't necessarily need to know the um, San Francisco equivalents of some of these brands. So um, when he said that, I had to research Booking.com, and I was like, is it that you guys are running out of designers in Europe? Why would you want to come to Africa to get a designer? And it was like, oh, we want to build a diverse team, blah, blah, blah. OK, I'll do that. <laughs> I'll um, give the interview a shot. And I was like, OK. I, I passed the interview. And I moved to Amsterdam several months after. Um, so for me, it's really humbling, and it's, um, it's a glad position I found myself coming from. Really, like, where I came from is like really slum. It's one of the places where people are scared to visit when you come to Lagos. And seeing myself like, in this kind of environment, talking to like, great minds like you guys, I'm really excited about that. So before I left Lagos, one of the things I did was work on a program called IET. Um, IET was myself and a friend called Akinyele. We went to the suburbs that we came from, or the slums that we came from, to teach kids how to code and design. Um, Akinyele is a seasoned developer um, in Lagos, Nigeria. He called me up and he said, oh, I have this idea for this program. I've been thinking about it for years. Can we do it right now? And I'm like, OK, I can handle the design part of it. I'll put together a curriculum. It did the um, programming bit of it. We picked kids between the ages of 12 to 16. Um, it was very low budget. We 
we didn't want to be, um, we didn't want to get it slowed down by the orders of talking to people to finance it. So it was pretty much anything we could get around to, to get the program started. Um, the, um, the location was donated by a small church in the neighborhood and um, the laptops, um, quite, quite an interesting story getting laptops. We just went around to friends and say, if you have any abandoned laptop that you don't think you are using anymore, we need to use it for these programs. And we got a bunch of folks to do, donate their laptops to us. And um, so because of that, we had kids, we gave the laptops to the kids. Um, we had kids with really old Macs in the class, Windows, Linux, and all sort of, you know, dissimilar computers. Um, and at that point, it was evident that we needed a tool to teach design that kind of works with all the, all, all, all these um, laptop, various kind of laptops. And that was how I discovered Figma. And um, yeah, it's, it's um, been good. The kids enjoy the classes and it's, it's, it's been fun all the way. Um, I believe this kind of idea, this kind of initiative would kind of open economic opportunities for them um, in, a, in a country or in a society where there is not so much opportunities. This, I mean, this is the kind of thing that they need. Yeah, I'm glad I was able to do it. Thank you. Cool. I think part of what intrigued me when B and I talked was the fact that there were some things that were so radically different from the way I know like designers um, studying design in the States and getting jobs experience, like kind of like electricity outages and not being able to kind of have the things that you need to like file your freelance project on time. Uh, but at the same time, there were so many similarities to the stories we hear that you guys I'm sure know about um, students like didn't know about design when he first got into it, and then um, companies didn't know that they needed it, and so he was kind of having to convince them or sell them on like the purpose of this. And then as like time went on, it started to expand, the demand expanded, and um, it got a lot more popular. Okay, so we've got uh, 12 more minutes left, and uh, a bunch of you have sent in good questions, so we're gonna go through some of them. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, one person that was supposed to be on this panel. His name is Namso. Um, Dylan actually mentioned him during his keynote. Um, he has run uh, an internship that's huge uh, in Nigeria that helps teach people. He was uh, also one of the first people that we got introduced to when we were exploring design education in the early days. And he wasn't able to make it because his visa was blocked. And so it just felt like something we should acknowledge given this is a panel about design accessibility and um, kind of giving equal opportunity to like the career opportunity. So Noms is amazing. I'm glad he got a shout out in Dylan's keynote and we just didn't want to hold the panel without kind of mentioning him. Um, okay, so you've sent in a bunch of questions. Um, I think the first one that I want to start with is actually the person that disagreed with me because I think that's interesting. Um, I don't, oh, this is Dan, Pansy, at Pansy Dan. Um, and he basically was like, okay, coding, sure. Coding had a boom in the job market. We know that, but design, and especially graphic design, suffered from an oversaturation of graduates. Any thoughts on the future of UX, UI design, and the market demand? And so he's basically like, suspicious, is like, this doesn't, this doesn't sound like my experience, like, there's too many people and not enough jobs. And uh, I'm curious, like, what you guys think from what you've been seeing, especially the people who um, teach at university, have taught at universities and see the kids coming out of that. Yeah. Um... So, I mean, I can speak to like my program uh, between like 2017 and 2018, uh, we had like 100% job placement. Um, and like, in, in, like our, our program is called New Media. Um, we don't actually have a title for the people that come out of it um, because they're so like interdisciplinary. You know, back in the day, we might've been interaction designers, there were flash designers, flash developers. Um, it's constantly changing, right? The tools change, the roles change. Um, but you're still fundamentally doing like problem solving communication. Like there's always going to be that need. There's always going to be that, that, uh, uh, that's out there. Um, Maybe you could speak to kind of like the, I think there is a big difference from talking to you guys between graphic design, traditional mm -hmm. graphic design and product and tech design. And I know you talked a little bit about, um, kind of like the salary differential and job placement. Yeah. So, um, there's, there's, there's actually, RIT is, um, 
it's very traditional. Like we actually house the Vignelli Center. Uh, the graphic design program is vastly different than the uh, new media design program. Uh, they might start talk talking interaction stuff in their senior year. Um, there, our students do fundamentally different things. And the students that come out of our program, you know, they can do anything from you know, being an interaction designer to being like a motion graphics designer um, to like, you know, working on like a Peter Jackson film. You know, we have students go to the mill and what a digital. Um, we, don't, we don't box ourselves within product design, um, but our students are able to kind of bleed into like other disciplines. And, you know, there's a convergence. Myself, I have my master's in industrial design. Um, when I worked at Imagix, I helped, you know, uh, uh, think about our server racks. Yeah. You know, so. Um, Elizabeth, I know that like you also, you're like, okay, nobody was hiring designers or there were no design internships. Maybe you could talk yeah, about so, that. Yeah, um, so the first time I was looking for a design internship, I was at a CS career fair and I was like begging all the recruiters. I was like, um, would you be interested in like a design intern? And everyone's like, what's that? And I was like, okay. Um, and then I, so I basically like got on a team as a dev intern and then I like tried to become a design intern, which kind of worked. Um, I think what's happening now, um, I'm just going to skip the middle part just for time, but I think what's happening now <laughs> is that like, if you search like LinkedIn or any job platform for a design job, um, there are a lot of design jobs. Like, yeah. It's not like no results. Um, I think the thing that um, I've noticed is that a lot of teams are hiring for more senior and lead designers. Um, every time I see someone tweet something, they're like, hey, like, um, my team is looking for a senior designer who can do like three million magical things. Like, does this person exist? Um, and I've also been in these hiring processes before as well, where like, we're reviewing these like, portfolios and stuff, and designers are very, very picky. And so I think the thing now is that there are a lot of design opportunities available, but um, are the teams actually making them, like, are, are teams who are hiring actually being open to anyone to, like, be a part of their team, or are they like kind of putting together a list of requirements that are like impossible to fulfill? But just a question for all of you. Yeah, can I just add? Oh yeah. That? I think that um, there's certain things that are happening in the industry that everyone needs to know about, which is, is that the college design industry has not caught up with the where the design industry is right now in terms of graphic design and product design. There's actually not. Um, an under-saturation of opportunities for designers. The problem is, is that there has been, over the years, there's been a shift in the way that, uh, uh, the shift in the amount of jobs or the type of jobs that are happening, that are coming out that traditional design schools have not um, done enough to sort of get students caught up to where the design industry now is. So there is a gap. So. I get students that come in that have traditional graphic design degrees, but the industry is saying, we want product design, we want these things, and we have all these other opportunities. We're in VR, we're doing AR, we're doing AI, and the design industry hasn't caught up with that yet. So what's happening is, is that they're coming out and they're looking for these job opportunities, and they have to further uh, enhance their skills to be able to meet these job, uh, the job requirements. So, I think that's kind of what's happening um, is, you know, with, with the engineering, from an engineering standpoint, there's been an increase of like 29, 30% more um, uh, of engineers that are applying at these different jobs versus design. It hasn't gotten there yet. And so there's just a lot of um, things that play into, you know, um, students coming out and, and, and getting these students into these career positions. So it turns out I thought we were finishing at 2, and it looks like I might have gotten that wrong, and it's 1.50. I did want to tell you that uh, the panelists have all agreed to answer your questions in that Figma file um, after this wraps up. So you will be getting answers, and you should check back in on it if you didn't get to have your question answered. Um, thank you guys all so much. All right. for